Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online POSI webinar series. Uh, we hand over the proceedings to the president of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, Good Dr. Deren Ganjwala. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online POSI webinar series. Good evening, friends, and good morning, Scott. Warm welcome to the webinar series of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. This is our 21st webinar. And we are really fortunate to have an expert, esteemed expert with us. Before I formally introduce him, I have to do one unpleasant task. With profound grief, I have to inform you that one of our positive member, Dr. Hamid Rahimullah from Mazar-e Sarif, Afghanistan, passed away last week fighting COVID. Hamid did his fellowship from Christian Medical College, Velour in 2010. And since then, he was a very active POSI member. And I'm sure that you must have met him at various uh, POSICON in last few years. Now, as a token of respect, uh, I request you to observe one minute silence. Thank you. God bless everyone. Now, let me introduce uh, Dr. Scott Cousin. The Scott Cousin is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon as well as hand surgeon at Shriner Hospital of Philadelphia. He won the prestigious Winland Medal in 2010. And coincidentally, the topic of his research for that medal was also a brachial plexus birth palsy. In the year 2014, he was selected as the president of American Society for Surgery of Hand. And during his presidentship, he launched a wonderful program on uh, helping the developing countries. The program is Touching Hand. So basically in that, the experts in the hand surgery, they visit the countries of a resource challenge areas and they carry out hand surgery over there. Now, we know that uh, Scott is a literal thinking in the brachial plexus, but he is at, work, uh, at present the world famous for a surgery on this boy, the Zion Harvey. I will tell you a brief background about this. From the picture, you can see that he has a bilateral amputation. When Zion was two years old, he got a severe infection. And due to that, he had to be operated and amputated at both the wrist and hand and both legs. Because he is a children, like he used to manage with even with uh, two sides amputation, bilateral amputation. However, in 2015, under the leadership of Dr. Scott Cozin, the 40 experts worked for more than 12 hours and they carried out a first surgery in the world. And that was basically a bilateral transplantation of the hand. So Scott is popular at this stage for this innovative and a very uh, dynamic approach. And you will be thinking about what are the results of this surgery. So these are the few pictures of uh, Zion after surgery. Like he's playing the games, he's trying to carry out various activities. And the most important thing is like, uh, he can start writing also and drawing also. And this video is going to show you the success of his surgery. And lastly, while playing baseball, we always need a good three-dimensional control over the hand. 
and this is what his ability so we are really fortunate to have dr scott posin with us and now i request him to share his screen and share his knowledge about the brachial plexus thank you Uh, let me get this going here. One second. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Greetings from the United States of America. Uh, first and foremost, I'm sorry to hear about your colleague, Hamid. It sounded like he was a wonderful person. It would, I would love to have met him. Secondly, it's, it was a super nice introduction about Zion Harvey who's coming up to his five year anniversary of his hand transplantation. Uh, Zion is a special person and I've been lucky to care for him and other children over the last 25 years. So what I'm gonna to speak to this evening is brachial plexus birth palsies. And I'm not gonna speak about the microsurgery that's kind of a nuance. I'm more gonna speak about the secondary consequences that pediatric orthopedic surgeons treat with respect to the brachial plexus palsies and the musculoskeletal ramifications following brachial plexus palsy make up the majority of my practice. So about half my practice is brachial plexus palsies, but a minority is nerve related. Most of it is the secondary musculoskeletal consequences. So I'll talk about the shoulder joint and then depending upon the time, I'll talk about the elbow and I have a little bit on the forearm. I do miss my time in India. I visited India in 2013 in Combator with Raj and Dr. Harry. It was a, a memorable experience. My wife and I, Louise, well, I spent a couple of weeks over in India. Uh, we look forward to this COVID pandemic being over and we look forward to returning to India. I always say that the most frightening words that I hear when I was in India was it's time to cross the street because there were so many cars and so many people, but I, we had such a wonderful time. So I look forward to returning to India as soon as this is over. So the take home points from my talk are as follows. With reference to the shoulder, the deformity occurs very early in their age of these children following brachial plexus birth palsies, usually less than one year of age. The key is recognizing the problem. Once you recognize the problem, there are a variety of treatment options that are available. The clinical examination is the key to recognize the problem because plain x-rays are, are rarely helpful. So just like in DDH, you know, the hip is not ossified and the shoulder is not ossified. The, the big point about early diagnosis is it allows more surgical and non-surgical options. So the first question is how early does it occur? So they're usually less than a year. In fact, in this one study that looked at 16 consecutive children or 17 shoulders, in children less than five months of age, there was only a normal shoulder in five out of seven. In older children, the glenoid was present normally in only two of 10. So what happens to the shoulder? Well, if you think about the way God made the shoulder in general, it's relatively unbalanced. For whatever reason, we are much stronger in internal rotation or bringing our hand to our belly than we are in external rotation or throwing a baseball. And this imbalance that's already present is further disrupted after brachial plexus palsies, especially the most common palsy, which affects C5 and C6 or the upper trunk. So here is our normal shoulder. This is like a seesaw or a golf ball on a tee. On the left side of the screen, you see all the muscles that provide internal rotation, the latissimus dorsi, the teres major, the subscapularis, and the pectoralis major. And on the right side of the screen, you see the muscles that provide extra rotation, mainly the infraspinatus and also the teres minor. So we're already offset with reference to our strength and we're much stronger in bringing our hand to our belly than bringing our hand away from our side and throwing a baseball. So why, I'm not really sure why, but what happens is when you have a C5, C6 injury, what you knock out are the teres minor and the infraspinatus and you have some maintenance of innervation to the latissimus dorsi, teres major, subscapularis, and pectoralis major. 
So you've taken a problem that we already have and you've made it worse. And that propensity leads to lack of active extra rotation initially, but then the contracture develops over time. So here is the shoulder after a C5, C6 injury that's axonometric primarily with disruption of the axons. And this is the problem that leads to deformity. So how do we figure it out? The diagnostic tests are physical examination first and foremost. We can also use ultrasound, which we use in our office, and then MRI, and I'll show you pictures of both of these. When we explain the problems in the shoulder after brachial plexus palsy, we, com we compare it to the hip. So pediapods always know that when there's lack of hip abduction, there can be underlying DDH. It's the same with the shoulder. There's lack of external rotation. In addition, there's apparent shortening of the limb, just like the hip, because the ball drives out of the back of the socket. So shortening of the limb is one finding, limited extra rotation, just like limited abduction in the hip. And then again, very similar to the hip, asymmetric skin folds. So as soon as you develop these signs, you need to be concerned there's underlying glenohumeral joint dysplasia. <laughs> so the question is, when does it really get in, 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 into, into a problem? If you tuck your elbows in your side and your arms are facing forward, that's neutral extra rotation and neutral intra rotation. If you can passively extend the elbow or extend the shoulder to 30 or 40 degrees, you're likely okay with reference to ball and socket alignment. If your contracture is such that you can't actually rotate past that point, you need to be concerned about the ball falling out of the back of the socket. So once that happens, we need to image the shoulder joint. Remember, again, just like the hip, plain x-rays are not helpful. In fact, we don't even attain plain x-rays in routine practice. Another interesting fact, similar to DDH, is the ossification is delayed on the shoulder that's in trouble. So the brachial plexus palsy, which often affects the right side, if the shoulder is not developing normally, the ossification is delayed in the humeral head. Now, what we do use in our office is ultrasound. Now, we do not rely upon the radiologist, just like a lot of pediatric orthopedic surgeons. We just do this ourselves. So this is my partner, Dr. Z. Uh, there's the child sitting on the mom's lap, and there's the ultrasound from the posterior portal. And in essence, it's really nice because there's no anesthesia. The child's resting comfortably, and it's a dynamic evaluation because you can rotate internal and external rotation. Now remember, in turn rotation or hand on belly, the ball is going to come out the back of the socket. Extra rotation is going to put the ball back in the socket. So here is an ultrasound. So when the shoulder goes in extra rotation, you see the ossific nucleus drive toward the glenoid. So posterior is to the top of the slide, anterior is to the bottom of the slide, the glenoids to the right, and the humeral head is to the left with the humeral shaft. And what you see is in extra rotation, there is improvement of alignment, but in intra rotation, the ball comes out of the socket. So currently this is a reducible joint, but it's going to develop dysplasia. And dysplasia is character dysplasia is characterized by humeral head subluxation posteriorly and glenoid retroversion. Now, the best test, you one second, sorry. The best test for assessing the glenoid and the humeral head is an MRI. So this is a normal MRI. So a normal MRI is like a golf ball on a tee. If you draw a line down the scapular spine, it should go through the middle of the humeral head and about 50% of the humeral head should be anterior to that line and 50% backwards. In terms of the alignment, again, it should be about 90 degrees or perpendicular. So that's a normal MRI. What happens over time is they become dysplastic. And the normal MRI is on the left and the abnormal is on the right. And what you see is the humeral head is migrated posteriorly. You're getting a false glenoid, just like you do in the hip, and the shoulder is internally rotated. So what we want to prevent is the MRI on the right and what we want to maintain is the MRI on the left. So now once we have made the diagnosis, what can we do? If the shoulder is reducible, right? Meaning we can put it back in under ultrasound, then you can try other options such as Botox casting and therapy. So that's the importance of making the early diagnosis 
when the joint is still reducible. You can do early tendon transfers if it fails non-operative management. We tend to try at least one round of Botox and casting. So we use Botox and casting in the following fashion. The child is put up under anesthesia. Uh, we use a stimulator. Some people use ultrasound to look at the muscle. We put an insulated needle into the intended muscle. We verify it by stimulation. And then we inject, inject the Botox on a weight-based dosage. So remember, 10 units per kilogram of Botox is totally within the safe zone. And then we divide it into three equal aliquots. We wanna weaken the internal rotators, like I said before, pec major, latissimus dorsi and teres major, and the subscap. So this shows the pec major being injected. And this shows the subscap being injected along the anterior portion of the scapula. And again, electrical stimulation is very helpful with an insulated needle. And then we do take advantage of them being under anesthesia and place them in a cast. We keep the cast on for about three weeks because after three weeks, the Botox has been maximally effective and they'll be very weak in interrotation. In fact, the parents are often concerned that they're never gonna to touch their belly again, but over time, three months, four months, five months, or six months, the Botox wears off. Now, what this gives us time for is the following. Number one, we can resume therapy and keep the ball within the socket. Number two, we're adding additional time to allow renervation of the infraspinous and the teres major by the suprascapular and the axillary nerves. So we're biding some time. Clearly, if those muscles do not renervate, then the imbalance remains and additional surgery is going to be necessary. So the question is, how well does this technique work? So how do you define success will determine how well it works. So our colleagues, Mary Beth Ozaki and, co and colleagues showed it works about 70% of the time. But their definition of success is when they, can, when they did not have to perform a redu open reduction or arthroscopic reduction. And they said that was a success. So we looked at our results and said, wait a second, if they still need an operation, why don't we define success as never needing an operation to restore extra rotation? That's a success. Temporizing the treatment is not really a success. So when we looked at our data carefully, more carefully, we said success was no open, no close, or no surgical reduction. So therefore no subsequent procedure for extra rotation. And our results were not nearly as good. Only 16% of the time did the child not require secondary surgery to improve abduction and improve extra rotation. And we looked more carefully at our data only those kids with passive extra rotation greater than 30 degrees were successful. And those that had extra rotation less than 15 degrees all failed. So we now tell our parents, listen, we're gonna try the Botox and casting once, but if it fails once, they're gonna need an operation to restore balance about around the shoulder. And that operation is gonna take two internal rotators, mainly latissimus dorsi and teres major, and make them into extra rotations or attend a transfer. So we'll talk about that. So lesson learned, as Churchill said, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. And that has certainly been our trials and tribulations with treatment of brachial plexus palsy and secondary deformity. Now, once the joint is irreducible, whether you use ultrasound or your clinical examination, you need an operation. And this operation in terms of timing has gotten younger and younger and younger and younger. Because if you leave the ball out the socket, just like you leave the hip out of the socket, bad things happen over time. So you need to put the ball back in the socket. You can do it via an open reduction, which I'll show you our current technique, or you can do it arthroscopic, which is another technique. We use both in our clinical practice. Why do we need to put the ball back in the socket? So it can remodel. And we've shown that the glenoid can remodel if the force is redistributed by putting the humeral head onto the socket. So here's an example. This is a two and a half year old child. So again, up is anterior, down is posterior. And you can see there's progressive loss of extra rotation with minus 30 degrees of passive extra rotation with the scapula stabilized. And you can see that the ball is dropping out the back of the socket. 
and the glenoid is tilting backwards, which we call retroversion. This has now become irreducible and requires surgery. In this particular case, we did an arthroscopic reduction. So the child's kind of on the side, they're in the louder cubis position. The arm is up and the body is down. We're looking from, from the posterior portal to the front. The biceps tendon is at one o'clock and we're using this electrocordary to release the subscapularis tendon, the intraarticular portion of the subscap tendon to allow for the joint reduction. The entire upper rolled border of the subscap is, is released. You can use a biter or electrocordary and you wanna leave any pink muscle you see behind because you wanna preserve some type of interrotation. So at about six o'clock or to nine o'clock, you see that pink muscle, that's the subscapularis muscle. That's the inferior, port of the subs, inferior portion of the subscapularis that's innervated by C7. And you wanna leave that portion intact to maintain interrotation. Uh, this is an MRI taken pretty much while the child was still in a cast. And you can see what we've done is we've taken the humeral head, which was centered on the false glenoid, and now put it back onto the normal glenoid to allow for what we call remodeling. I'm not convinced it's remodeling like Hooter Volkman, but in essence, it's a, in essence, it's a redistribution of pressure and the water runs into the cartilage gags and it fills back up and there's early restoration of the glenoid alignment. If you look at the clinical examination, when it reduces and there's a pseudo glenoid, you have this palpable click, right? So that is out and that is in. That is out and then it goes back in in extra rotation. So that's a good example of an arthroscopic reduction. And then again, we put them in a cast. Uh, the cast time varies from anywhere from three, four, five weeks. I'm not sure it makes any difference. And then they come back for some therapy for a week or so. There's a pink cast intact. Now, what else have we learned about the, this arthroscopic capsule release? It really works. So in essence, if you look at the parameters for version, there's improvement in version. If you look at the reduction in humeral head subluxation, it's lessened. If you look at their range of motion, it's improved, especially in extra rotation. What we also learned was if you want to improve their abduction or overhead motion, you need to add a tendon transfer to act as a humeral head depressor. Here's a classic cl clinical example. The preoperative MRI is on the top and the post is on the bottom. So you've gone from the abnormal configuration to a normal configuration. Here's the classic findings of improved abduction. Good extra rotation for hand to neck, hand to top of the head and hand to the ear. Good adequate extra rotation. Uh, still some reciprocal loss of internotation or shoulder extension. And then importantly, in this initial cohort, 18 out of the 19 children with a pseudoglenoid or that false glenoid corrected to a normal configuration. We did have better outcomes, better clinical outcomes in those that were younger, which is interesting, and those with less deformity, which kind of makes sense, again, similar to the hip. In terms of open reduction, uh, we've moved a little bit more toward open reduction because we think the coracoid may be a block to reduction. I learned this from Francisco Soldado, my friend in Spain. We just posted a new video of this on our website called littlearms.org. It's a little bit long video, so I didn't include it in the talk. Rather, I'll just show you the technique, but if you want the video, you can get it from our, our website. But here's Abel. He's a two-year-old with right brachial plexus palsy. He had microsurgery at eight months, as you see above. His shoulder was extremely tight. We did an ultrasound that showed humeral head subluxation. And then we had we obtained an MRI. So again, this is the same shoulder, the same bad shoulder. And what you see in, on the MRI is the biceps is really internally rotated, the head's pointing posterior, and the glenoid's deforming. If you let this go for a few more months, you end up with the MRI I showed you previously with a large false glenoid. So how do we approach this currently? It's an anterior deltal pectoral approach. It's not very difficult at all, at all. The deltoid goes up and the pectoralis goes down. You wanna find the coracoid and we now remove the coracoid because we feel it may block the reduction anteriorly. It also allows better access to the subscapularis. We then find the subscapularis at the rotator interval and we wanna release the subscapularis. 
Now, what's fascinating is sometimes when you first peek in the joint, so the Alice at six o'clock is, is holding the capsule down, you're looking into the glenoid, and what you don't see is the humeral head. Why? Because the humeral head is migrated posteriorly. You need to sequentially release the subscap, and then over time, watch this, kaboom. So when the arm moves into interrotation, it drops out the back, and when the arm goes into extrarotation, it reduces the joint. So it's the same situation I showed you before with the clinical video. You're just now looking at it directly from the front of the, of the deltal pectoral interval, and you're seeing the humeral head reduce in extrarotation and subluxate in interrotation. And clinically, it looks like this. Again, similar to the other picture I showed. So that's our open reduction. I don't think it matters whether you do it open or arthroscopic. I think the results will be similar. We've just gotten used to the open reduction because it's a little bit faster and it doesn't involve all the equipment. Now, what about tendon transfers? So the explanation of tendon transfers, you take two tendons that pull you down and in, the tismus dorsi anterius major, and you put them on the humeral head in a different spot so they bring you up and out. So up and out instead of down and in. What do we know about tendon transfers? This is interesting, is the tendon transfers reliably improve motion. No doubt about it. What tendon transfers don't do though, is they don't allow joint remodeling. So an extra articular procedure will not remodel an intra-articular problem. But we do know that from a results standpoint, tendon transfers will give you this type of result on the modified malay. Global abduction will go up a, a scale, global extrotation up a grade, hand to neck up a grade, hand to spine doesn't change, hand to mouth up a grade, and hand to belly button will likely lose a grade. So prior to surgery, you need to make sure they have adequate interrotation to put their hand on the belly button so they don't use the, lose that important task of buttoning and zippering. In our laboratory, we've been looking at these tendon transfers, and what we're starting to realize is a lot of the improvement occurs at the scapulothoracic joint rather than the glenohumeral joint. It's how little we really know about kinematics of the shoulder joint. We've been able to separate the scapulothoracic motion like you see here from the glenohumeral joint motion in the, capture, in the motion capture lab and it's leading to very interesting results. It's used from a research standpoint, but now we use it from a clinical basis when making difficult decisions. So again, like I said before, our tendon transfer data does not show remodeling. So if the joint is out, you need to address the joint. If you wanna just improve their motion, a tendon transfers will approve the motion without joint remodeling. So we currently favor early tendon transfers for mild glenohumeral joint dysplasia or to prevent progression or if they failed Botox or in the normal joint that just needs more motion because tendon transfers will improve their motion. Now, what about other surgical options? Clearly, glenoid osteotomy is an option. Again, this correlates to Blount's disease, if you think about it. It's a similar idea of, of elevating that depressed, depressed plateau or that false glenoid. Uh, we've done this maybe 10 times or so. I don't know where it falls into the algorithm. Currently, it falls in our algorithm if they failed an initial attempt at an open reduction. There's persistent de deformity and there's persistent glenoid retroversion. But that's, time will tell where that fits into the picture. Now, humor osteotomy has a clear place. So in those older children with established glenohumeral joint deformity, and there's no way they're gonna remodel. Again, take the hip patient that's 12 or 14, they're not gonna remodel. We can't affect that joint motion, we can just reposition the limb. So this is the classic trumpeteer sign. The only way this child can bring their hand to their mouth is by shoulder abduction and bringing their hand to the mouth because there's no way they can actually rotate. We don't realize that we need a little bit of extra rotation to bring our hand to our mouth. Otherwise we need to bring our arm away from the side. Now, what we, what we do know in these older set of kids, it's been shown by the Boston group that it improves their function, right? So it improves their extra rotation and it really does make a difference. So we looked at our results at 24 kids a few years ago. I tend to use a medial approach because it's a cosmetic approach. We correct them 44 degrees and there was an aggregate improvement in their Malay scores like on the table I showed you previously. 
So I'll give you an example. This is a 12-year-old female with left residual brachial plexus palsy. She has pretty good abduction to 160 degrees, but what she can't do is she can't externally rotate. And she's to the point where she can't even touch her ear. So how are we going to fix her a problem? She's too old to remodel and she's too much advanced deformity in her glenohumeral joint. So we can cut the humerus and rotate it into a better position. Again, making sure that we don't lose midline activity. Here, is try here she is trying to actually rotate and here is her trumpeteer sign. And here's us together. Here's our medial approach. So again, we prefer a medial approach to the arm. So the, uh, the biceps is up and the triceps is down. That's the ulnar nerve. We tend to remove the intermuscular septum. So the ulnar nerve goes posterior. The median nerve and brachial artery go anterior. We identify the humerus. We put a plate on provisionally, the top three holes. Then we put a K wire. You see the K wire off axis. That's our intended amount of extra rotation correction. Then we cut the bone and rotate it such that the K wire is through the fourth hole. And then we drill and fill. And here's what she looks like postoperatively. But more important than her x ray is here's her range of motion. There's her abduction. There's her hand to mouth with no trumpeteer sign whatsoever. Here's her hand to her ear, which she could never do before. Here's hand to back of the neck with her medial incision well, well healed. And she can still touch her belly button. So that's the key. It's the key to life. It's balance, right? You're trying to balance X rotation into rotation. If you overcorrect her, she'll be great in hand to mouth and hand to top of head, but she'll lose her ability to belly button and pull up her pants. And that's a problem. So that's what we do for advanced glenohumeral joint dysplasia in the older children. Now, a question that we get asked a lot is what about stabilization of the shoulder by tendon transfer in the flail shoulder? It doesn't work. The point is don't do it. So we have found tendon transfers to be unreliable for restoring stability to the very flail shoulder. And that includes the trapezius transfer that people talk about. All the trapezius transfer will do is reduce some of the pseudo subluxation, but it doesn't give you enough stability. Because the problem is if you have a real flail shoulder, it's difficult to reconstruct and it impairs the entire limb because they can't position a working hand in space with an unstable shoulder. So you're gonna have to do something. So I'll show you an example here. This is a child with a traumatic left brachial plexus palsy affecting C5, C6, totally flail shoulder. No pain, but totally flail shoulder, right? And you can't restore that by tendon transfers. You can see obviously has no pain. So what do we do for the flail shoulder? Uh, we, will, we will absolutely fuse it. Whoops, sorry, let me go back, sorry. Let me go back. So we tend to perform a chondrodesis of the shoulder. So we use an external fixator because we want to leave the proximal growth plate of the humerus intact. So here's the external fixator. So now his shoulder is chondrodesed or fused. And here he is with a stable shoulder. So it's his left shoulder. This is Cheryl, our therapist, showing that now all his movement occurs from his scapothoracic joint. So a prerequisite for shoulder fusion is intact scapothoracic motors, which Stefan had. And there's a stable shoulder. Now, once you have a stable shoulder, then what? Then you can restore elbow flexion. In this particular case, we restored it with a free gracilis. So we took a gracilis from his leg and we hooked it up to his arm and motor it with intercostals. And now he has a stable shoulder and he can bring his hand to his mouth. So, so that's the whole concept of shoulder from mildly unstable to reducible to grossly unstable and irreducible to a flail shoulder. Now we're gonna talk about the elbow and then we'll see how we're doing on time. So we'll talk about the elbow. There's other joints, obviously the forearms, the joint, the wrist and hand, but elbows is critical. So two things happen to kids with brachial plexus palsies and their elbow. The first is as the muscles re right? So you take an elbow that doesn't bend, you re the bicep brachialis and brachioradialis. What happens is when those muscles re they don't grow in babies like normal muscle. 
So you take a child who couldn't bend their elbow to a child who develops an elbow contracture and now can't straighten their elbow. That's the most common problem we see. So it's an axonometric injury to C5, C6. There's renovation of the biceps and the brachialis. The child grows and their elbow becomes tight. It's frustrating to the parents because they were wishing and wanting and needed elbow flexion, not to need microsurgery, and now they can't get the elbow straight. What's the treatment? Prevention is the mainstay. You wanna avoid operating on these flexion contractures. Why? Because non-operative treatment does better than operative treatment. That's the bottom line. How do we manage them? We manage them with therapy. We manage them with serial static splitting, splinting. We manage them with serial casting and we use Botox. And we Botox all three elbow flexors, the biceps, the brachialis and the brachialis, just like I showed for the shoulder. The difference is this is very efficacious. And Howard Clark from Sick Kids in Toronto has showed that this is equally, if not better than surgery. And the numbers are easy to remember. You take whatever contraction the child has and, it, and you can cut it in half by Botox and casting. So if their contracture is 30 degrees, you do Botox and casting, you can decrease it to 15 degrees. If it's 50 degrees, you can decrease it to 25 degrees. And that's a substantial improvement in terms of their lessening their elbow contraction. Now, what about surgical release? Unreliable. Despite what people tell you, lengthening the brachial, brachialis, lengthening the biceps tendon, it's prone to recurrence. And if you think about it, it makes sense because what's the problem? It's the muscle itself. So if you don't address the tight muscle, then you're gonna have recurrence of deformity. Similar to like a Volkman's ischemic contraction, you have to do some type of slide. So we have done a few kids, a handful of kids, where we've actually slid the brachioradialis on the humerus, and we're waiting to see whether that'll lessen the chances of recurrence of the elbow flexion contraction. But that's for severe contractures, 90 degrees, 100 degrees, because they will get severe contractures if they're not treated. But the take home point for the elbow flexion contracture is treat it early and don't let it get to 90 or 100 degrees. The other problem you see in the elbow is there's lack of recovery of biceps and the brachialis. This is less common, but you typically will see it. Tendon transfer is the gold standard. Everyone talks about the variety of transfers, the Steinler, the triceps, the pec major, the latissimus dorsi, or the free muscle like I showed before. Uh, I'll give you a couple caveats. A flexor pronator transfer will only give you 90 degrees. Do not ever transfer the triceps to the biceps because they end up with really bad contractures. The pectoralis major can be transferred. Uh, it's a little bit of an ugly scar. Our favorite is clearly latissimus dorsi, which I'll show you one example of, and then I'll likely stop. Now, latissimus dorsi, you can see here on this skinny child, we're gonna have him adduct his arm and you can see the muscle coming around the side. Sometimes it's, diff sometimes it's difficult to detect how well it's functioning, but fortunately kids tend to be skinny and you can often see it. And if it works, our favorite transfer is what we call a bipolar transfer, meaning you're gonna take it out of the back and put it into the front, meaning the out of the back into the front of the arm, and you're gonna attach it to the coracoid above and the biceps or ra radius or ulna distally, it doesn't make any difference. So I'll give you one example. This is Adam, a four-year-old brachial plexus injury with absent right elbow flexion. Here's good passive extension and good passive flexion. How do we do it? So it's a little bit like the three suges. These are my partners. So we put them in the lateral decubitus position. We tend to harvest latissimus with a skin paddle so we can monitor the muscle itself and to add some additional skin to the front. So you can see the thoracodorsal pedicles when isolated. Here is the lat tendon inserting into the humerus at three o'clock and the origin at six o'clock. We're gonna take it from the from the back and pass it to the front through the deltal pectoral interval. And then we're gonna attach the tendon of the latissimus to the coracoid and the muscle portion down on the humerus, or I'm sorry, down, down on the ulna or the radius. I can't remember exactly where we attached it here. And that's what it looks like when we're done. Here's early outcome. And then here's later outcome. He has gained a little bit of weight but you can see some good elbow flexion. It really works well, this transfer. We use it both in brachial plexus palsy and in children with arthrogryposis. 
And the very last thing I'll touch about is the forearm. The forearm we forget a lot about because we don't think about it as a joint, but it clearly is a joint. It turns our palm up for supination activities and turns our palm down. It has two supinators, the biceps and the supinator, and two pronators, the pronator teres and the pronator quadratus. It tends to get tight, just like the rest of the joints. So you wanna have therapy and you wanna maintain both supination and pronation. A lot of times what happens is the kids lack pronation. So you wanna do a biceps rerouting. So you take the biceps as a supinator, make it into a pronator. And if they get a fixed deformity, uh, we've gone to this simple operation of a one bone form. We transpose the distal radius on the proximal ulna. I'll give you one last example. This is a wad, a five roll with residual brachial plexus palsy. He's had recovery of C5 and C6 with supination, but he sits fully supinated. And what we're gonna do, we're taking the surgery, we're gonna mobilize the volar structures here. And then we're gonna cut the radius and cut the ulna, which you'll see here. And we're gonna put the radius, the distal radius onto the, the proximal ulna, as you see here. And we're gonna shorten the form a little bit to allow for a lot of rotation and prevent any neurovascular problems. And then we'll rotate them. And there's his position. It's a crazy looking x-ray. Everything's healed together. And clinically, he's gone from here to here with marked improvement. And that is all I have. Whoops. So thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was uh, brilliant. Absolutely lucid to the point and with uh, good evidence backed up. So we've got a couple of questions from uh, uh, Rujuta Mehta, who does... Uh, brachial plexus surgery in Varya Hospital in India, Mumbai. So the question is, what is the youngest age that you would do Botox? And why do you give such a high dose of 10 units per kg? Because normally you would use about three to four units per kg. So that's a great question. So I will do Botox as soon as the ultrasound shows the humeral head is subluxated. So as soon as there is humeral head subluxation on ultrasound, we will do Botox and casting. And I, I, I may have misspoken. What I meant to say is 10 units per kilogram is the maximum dose. Max dose, so, okay. Yeah. Max, that's my fault. So clinically, okay. we'll use less than 10 units per kilogram. We just won't use more than 10 units per kilogram. Good point. Okay, okay. And she would also like to know about your work on the length of the coracohumeral ligament on MRI and what weightage do you give during open reduction to that contracted ligament? So we get rid of that ligament. <laughs> that's the bottom. Just, so I, I think it. we think that's part, we cut it. The yeah. cortical human ligament we cut when we do an open coracoidectomy. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, you have a question from Praveen Bharadwaj from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. So he asks, how early will you do a tendon transfer? If passive extend rotation is absent, pre-op, would they consider doing a transfer in a five-year-old child? So hello, Praveen, first of all. So we will do, we've done a whole bunch of tendon transfers now in children who are less than a year. So if they have failed the Botox and they resubluxate, we will do an early tendon transfer because we don't want to get to the point where the child is five and has deformity because that becomes problematic. So in the five-year-old child who still lacks extra rotation, we would image the child, probably an MRI. <laughs> Glenohumeral joint looked like we could reduce the ball in the socket. We would do that and likely add, to add tendon transfers, knowing there's a chance that the child may lose midline. Okay. Uh, Dr. Maulin Shah from Ahmedabad also is asking, what is the rate of external rotation contracture in a patient who underwent an open reduction? Yeah, great. So it's a great question. So let, let's spend a second talking about that. Because extra rotation is really compromising because they're stuck out away from their belly, especially the more impaired kids. So my partner okay. always says, I'd rather pull up my pants than high five my neighbor. Just to emphasize the fact that you don't want to get an extra rotation contracture. Okay. So we looked at our data and the following are risk factors. Uh, number one, if they've had microsurgery, right? That's a risk factor. Number two, if the injury is any more than a C5, C6 injury meaning 
a C5, C6, C7, or a C5 through T1, they're more prone to lose X rotation. We also believe, although we couldn't prove this, that if you transfer two tendons versus one tendon, meaning either the latissimus dorsi and the teres major versus both, there's a likelihood they're going to lose X rotation. So in those kids who have very weak interrotation and they have a global injury, we may make the decision to let the shoulder go, right? Because it's not worth it to take a hand that has marginal function and to put it out way away from the contralateral hand. Like this is the whole art of medicine. So in some children, the therapist will be like, the shoulder's going out the back and you'll be like, oh, well, it's, we're gonna let it go because we can't put it back in without losing midline activity and bringing their impaired hand closer to the non-impaired hand. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, how many times typically do you do the uh, anti-version osteotomy of the glenoid with the tendon transfers? Or do you think just balancing them will improve yeah. the uh, dysplasia? Yeah, I think balancing will do improve the dysplasia. So obviously that's a clinical decision. If you do the osteotomy and it stays reduced, uh, meaning the ball stays reduced, you can quit and go home. If you do the osteotomy and there's still some posterior subluxation, you may have to add a, a tendon transfer at that time. Although honestly, I don't like to do both operations at the same time, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Okay. Uh, Rujita also has a question. How do you manage winging of the scapula post tendon transfers, the exaggerated winging that you see? Right. That's, these are really good questions. So we've looked at winging in the lab a lot and everyone um, assumes and I'm, that winging may be neurologic. As we all know, it's not neurologic. It's due to the fact they don't have good glenohumeral joint motion and they compensate by moving their scapula and the scapula more. So the scapulothoracic okay. is really exaggerated. After tendon transfer, especially if you transfer the teres major to the posterior humeral head, what you're doing is you're linking the scapula and the humerus even more Mm -hmm. which leads to increased winging of the, of the scapula. We don't have a way to manage it other than to warn the parents beforehand, you may see more winging after the surgery. Because if you try yes. and limit the winging, you're mm -hmm. going to diminish their overall motion. So it's a trade-off that they have to accept. Yes, that's exactly right. All right. Uh, so uh, Maulin again has a question, how much humoral version affects the outcome of tendon transfer surgery? How does it affect? Do you think the humeral version affects your outcome of tendon transfer surgery? Yeah, we, you know, it's interesting. We thought it, that it did, but it didn't seem to make much of a difference. So I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, he also wants to quiz you asking you, uh, how do you treat anterior instability in extended herbs cohort? Anterior instability? Yes. Yeah, so if it's, a, it's, an, it's another great question. So if there is anterior instability, which usually can, not usually, can happen sometimes if your release is too much, they need just like a standard ladder J type procedure to block the anterior instability. We did one yesterday, but that's very, very rare. Most of the time it's in the back, it's, but every now and then you're right, it's in the front and our preferred procedure is a ladder J. Okay. So, okay. do you, do you think there is a role? Yep. Do, sorry, yeah, Dhiran Bhai, go ahead. Okay, fine. Like, uh, I will give you rest for a few minutes and then you can take over. Uh, Scott, the question is about the radial head uh, dislocation. Like, uh, how do you prevent it and then how do you manage it? Yeah, it's another great question. So, the radial head dislocation, obviously, in these children is different than the typical radial head dislocation. It's really because the biceps doesn't grow, right? So if the biceps doesn't grow, especially without an antagonist like a triceps, it tends to pull the radial head out of, out of position. Uh, we do not have a good treatment for that, which is interesting because we're the opposite in Montasia. We're so aggressive at reducing the radial head to maintain valgus stability to the elbow. In brachial plexus palsy, once the head goes up, it's from pull of the biceps and you have to make a decision whether you're going to reduce it or not. If you decide to reduce it, the one thing that has to go away is the biceps tendon. 
either have to mm -hmm. move the biceps tendon over to the brachialis or you have to decide to use the biceps tendon as part of your annular ligament reconstruction. But it's the same principles of Montasia if you decide to treat it. You need to get length first, so the rail head is distal to the capitellum, and then you can reduce it. You have to decide what to do with the ulna, but you got to get rid of the biceps in these particular patient population. Uh, so is there is there a role for derotation osteotomies? When would you do those as salvage procedures? In the is that the shoulder or the form? I'm sorry. For the shoulder. Yeah. So the derotation osteotomies are in the older kids with with established glenohumeral joint dysplasia. All right. So we'll go there. All right. Didn't buy? Yes. Uh, the problem which you did not discuss, which we see uh, quite uh, frequently in the practices about the shoulder, like a lot of those kids have uh, abduction and external rotation contracture. So how do you manage that? So the, it was, um, sorry, the question was, how do we manage the abduction and external rotation contracture at the shoulder? Yeah. Yeah. So I, there's a guy named Roger Cornwall at Cincinnati who's been working on this for well over a decade. The hope is going to be that there'll be a pharmaceutical management for these muscles that don't grow. That's what we really need. Right now we have what my mentor used to say, we have a surgical solution. We're trying to apply a surgical solution to a biologic problem. So all we really have to do is find something to allow these muscles to grow. Secondly, the only way we treat those deformities is by osteotomy. So we can either take them out of abduction by a varus osteotomy, we can take them out of extra rotation by an intra rotation osteotomy. We can do both at the same time, but it's not very gratifying surgery because the contractures can be severe. Okay. Uh, you have another question from Rujuta who asks In pan plexus mixed palsies, when you have a good recovery of shoulder, but the elbow forearm doesn't recover so well, uh, have you encountered cubitus varus along with the radial head dislocation? Right, so you, you, yes, the answer, you do get some cubitus, ver, cubitus varus or cubitus valgus? Varus. Um, She's asking cubitus varus. Yeah, so the answer, you see all sorts of different deformities. We think what happens, if you look at these kids carefully, they get a little bit of a Charcot joint. They don't have good proprioception in their joint, so they can have some dysplastic joints or not realize what their joint is doing, and they can go into to varus or actually valgus either direction. Mm -hmm. They're, it's usually not a functional problem because their hand is so marginal and they hold things in their antecubital fossa, mm -hmm. but they do get deformities. And I'm not 100% sure why, but we think it may be lack of proprioception in the joint or feeling in the joint. Okay. Um, the low palsies, the CAT1s with a poor hand function, is there any role for wrist fusion? How do you improve so, function of hand? Yeah. So everyone knows that the dilemma in brachial plex injuries is the lower trunk or CAT1. And when, we, when you do a microsurgery, whether it be contralateral C7 or grafting, and you get a suboptimal result, there are very few options to restore hand function because there's no available donors, like for a grease, free gracilis or anything. We yes. will fuse the wrist, I mean, right, if it acts just like a paddle. It's not really a functional fusion because they usually don't have enough opening and closing to warrant a functional fusion. We mm -hmm. like to delay any formal fusion until they're done growing because we have not had good results with trying to chondrodice the wrist. It's a good question. It's very, very frustrating. But they, because if they flop over into the mm -hmm. beggar's type position, they're so unhappy. So we'll sometimes rotate the form into pronation and fuse the wrist when they're adolescents but it's really more of an aesthetic operation than a functional operation. All right, so it just looks better and it works like a paddle. It works like a paddle, that's right. All right, okay. So are there any questions even by at your end? No, thank you. Thank you. So, so I think uh, most of us would like to really thank you for your honest and direct answers to most of our queries and uh, really simplifying and making this such a lovely and memorable lecture. So thank you, Scott. And we look forward to more wonderful surgery and probably would like to hear more again in detail about forearm and hand transplants, which you have been doing. And uh, I think Dhiran Bhai will get back to you.
to uh, talk about more uh, hand upper limb uh, yeah, webinars. naturally, like uh, the next lecture will be on the cerebral palsy. That's another area of his interest. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. I look forward to the day where I can visit India and give everybody a big old hug. We do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.